Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us tonight for the three-person positioning webinar. Um, I'm just going to take one minute to check our attendance list. I know there were quite a few people that emailed this afternoon looking for the link, so. <clears throat> Liz, am I supposed to have the PowerPoint up on my screen? I do not. Not yet. I haven't started sharing it. Let me do that. Okay. <laughs> and we're going to try to do a practice run on the question box. Yeah, so if um, you should be able to see my it. screen. Yep. Got it. So if I could have, um, I typically I run the PowerPoint and, or I don't run the PowerPoint, I run the webinar and <laughs> someone else runs the PowerPoint and I answer all the questions. So since I am speaking tonight and running the PowerPoint, I need to, we're just gonna real quickly, um, Stacy, I, Martin, I see that you're on. If you can hear this, can you just, write a quick question in the question box so that we can have our answer or practice. Oh, oh, thank you. Okay, so perfect. Thanks, Stacy. Um, Barb, did that come up? No, and I cannot see that on my end, wherever she wrote that question. That. Okay. I cannot see I that. I have the question box open. Ask her if she can put it in the chat box. And let me see if I can see it in the chat box. Daisy, if you see a chat box, can you just write in the chat box? Thank goodness we have Stacy on. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Stacy, I just unmuted you. Do I don't we... have a chat box, Liz. I okay. don't see a chat right. box in here. Okay. That's probably what I thought. So, all right. Um, so now you can mute me again. But I hope you're well. <laughs> thanks, Stace. Thanks for helping. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, then I will um, try to manage the questions as we go. I'm presenting probably the middle, the middle bulk of this. So please be patient with your questions and we'll um, come back to them after. Um, so, on that note, um, welcome, <clears throat> we'll just get started. Welcome to tonight's webinar. This is on three-person positioning. With postseason coming up, many of our areas are going to be covering playoff games with three people, three officials on the field, and often you're going to have a table official as well. So we're going to review some of the basics of three-person but we're also going to go into a little more advanced look at some positioning things, some focus, where you're focusing, and some game management as well. If you're new to three-person system, we do have some posted past basic webinars on three-person, and they're on the U.S. Lacrosse website. Um, we certainly don't recommend that people try to learn three-person during playoff games. As you know, these kids have been working super hard all year and we definitely deserve to give them our best um, so during this webinar there'll be a chat box like I just said and please be patient I can answer questions through the first half when I'm talking I will have to just come back to them um, also a reminder for anyone who does multiple levels of officiating so you may do youth high school and college especially those of you who who've been bouncing back and forth between high school and college. I love that you're you're servicing both levels of the game. You just have to be very diligent this time of year um, to make sure you're really 
clued in onto what um, what level you're doing on that day and make sure you know the rules, penalty administration, as and what we have posted um, on your sidebar, there should be a little bar that says handouts. So we have posted on that handout bar the PDF of the USL NCAA comparison chart. So you should be able to pull that off of here and that's a handy thing to have. Um, it's a great idea to review that stuff pregame with your with your partners um, and just go through hit really hit hard on the differences. So Maggie Walsh is also presenting with me. She's um, a training committee um, member forever <laughs> and has done a ton of content development, teaching. Um, and so I'm going to hand this off to Maggie. Okay, uh, our first question is uh, why, I need a slide, Liz, um, why are conferences using the three-person system? And um, as Liz said, uh, postseason is not the place to learn three-person or train others on three-person. These games should be given to the officials who have a, a good amount of experience in these skills. Tonight, we're going to review most of the basic skills here in the beginning. It will refresh your understanding and hopefully stimulate some questions for our conversations tonight. Use the question panel as often as you need to get an answer. We have officials standing by to help with the answers. Um, the three-person system is going to enhance the, the safety of the game, the fairness of the game. It's going to have the officials in better position to see the spaces between, and it's going to allow the official to see the game from multiple angles. So that's why the teams are asking, conferences are asking for three-person three system in their playoffs. Um, we have the A, B, and C positions. I'm clicking. Liz. I'm clicking. She's <laughs> clicking. Clicking. <laughs> OK, the A, B, and C positions. A and B will be on the table side. Mine did not click, Liz. No, there we go. Sorry. There we go. That's OK. She's new to this, everybody. So just, you know, bear with her. Um, note that A and B are on the table side. C is on the opposite side. Now, this is not um, in stone. If the sun is a problem at your game, you can switch these positions. And, and we know we can do that. Uh, position A will lead to the right and be a trail to the left. Now, this should be familiar to everybody because this is the same assignments that you have in the two-person system. Um, as far as restarts go on this screen, uh, can you give me three people? There you go. Okay. Uh, let's consider restarts in this three-person format as well. The A and B officials may have to call in transition and leave the restart. So if they, if A calls the foul, they can leave the restart, whether it be a self-start or a whistle, to the transitioning A or B on that side of the field. Please do not whistle the foul and then run away because without giving the other official an indication of who should be moving behind or away, even if it's a self-start situation, the ball carrier still has the option of waiting for the player to move to the proper position as dictated by the foul type. So she may stand there a while, and if you come up as the B official after the A's made the call, you have to know who is supposed to go behind or who is supposed to move away. So if you call the foul and then give it to the B official and you move on down the field, make sure you give the information to that B official. Um, then the B official will lead to the left and then will ser serve as a deep trail when the ball goes to the A end. So this is going to be a little new for newer people, but um, hopefully we have a good bunch of experienced people here with us tonight. Um, restarts again, the A and B will hand off the administration of restarts in their swim lane. So they're on the outside lane and 
they will hand off their restarts. Make sure that your partner has the pertinent information. Now, when we get to C, C will conduct all the draws and will act as a second lead and a second trail in both ends of the field. So when the ball's on her side, at this end of the field, she'll be the second lead. And when the ball's on the other side, away from her, she will be the second trail. C will escort the ball down the field and A and B will, as A and B adjust for position. Each, fish, each official will work in, uh, in each position and have different responsibility. Uh, the team rotates every two goals. A moves to B, B moves to C, C moves to A. Touching on restarts here with the, with the assistance of a C in restarts, can she assist in a restart? Well, yes. In a situation where the foul is called by A or B in the midfield and the play is transitioning to one end or the other, the C official, who is a scoring play, may take, in quotes, the restart to allow the lead to quickly to get in position at her end of the field. So. The C is going to have that um, capability as well as, as helping with the restarts. We have one other important job for the C official in transition, and that is <laughs> that is picking up the restraining line from the trail, A or B, where, where appropriate. Don't, so don't forget that job as well. When we move into boundaries, C will have the entire sideline on the far side, away from the table, and will assist the lead with the coffin corners. The lead A and B will have the end boundary on her lead end of the field, as well as sharing the side boundary on the side of the field. The deep trail A or B will, res will be responsible to move the boundary, move to the boundary to assist the lead when the call is deep in the lead's end of the field. By doing this, the deep trail allows the lead to stay in closer proximity to the goal and will be in position to make a call should a quick pass put the ball back into the CSA. Remember, all boundary restarts may be self-starts. Even those that go over the end line behind the goal and are re-entered into the CSA. But we all know we have one exception. What is it? Which boundary restart is a whistle start? Ask the ref in the question box. If you know the answer, give the answer. We'll give it to you later. So our question is, which boundary restart is a whistle start? OK, now the ball is in the critical scoring area. These are the arcs of movement. Let's consider when there is play inside the CSA. Notice the location of the ball. And the arc of movement is the general movement of officials in each of these positions. They will move, of course, in relation to the location of the ball. So as a ball moves, you move. The deep trail and C are going to try to move together so that the center of the middle of the arc is covered. Each official's responsibilities may change when the ball moves. For example, free space to call goal will be called a C's responsibility. And then that responsibility will go over to trail when the ball moves in front of the trail official and then C will be off ball. Restarts in the CSA going in or out are usually the lead or the old lead's responsibility. But if the ball is way out on C side, she's capable of doing those restarts also. In the next slide, we have lead covering the orange area on ball here. Notice where the ball is. The deep trail in the blue square, it could extend farther down. These are not permanent areas, as we all know. 
It depends on where the ball is, but you need to know your responsibilities in these areas. Like on these squares right here, the C official obviously is going to take some things from the lead official if it goes down into the coffin corner and then she has a good view of the spaces between those players. And then the deep trail would move over to help cover the middle for free space to goal. And the little warning sign there is that it, it depends. It depends where the ball is. It depends um, the situation in the game. So don't take these as borders of your coverage. This is just a general idea of uh, where you should look, but don't stop looking beyond it. Everything is going to overlap in the game and you're going to help each other with that. Okay, the responsibilities. Please note where the ball is before we list these responsibilities here. Each official has specific responsibilities. Now, some of them are this, the same as you would notice in a two-person game, but we're going to share a few things here. So we're going to do the first, the lead is going to be on ball. And why is she on ball in this situation? <clears throat> She's in quadrant one, the ball is in quadrant two. She has on ball responsibilities. She has a goal circle, fouls after the shot. The lead also can call free space to goal. If it's in close, she can call any picks that she sees on the ball. But her basic responsibility with the ball in this position is on ball fouls. The next person, the C, with the ball in this position, has all the off ball calls, the holding, the detaining, picks, the whole list there. Um, dangerous follow through, dangerous propel, fouls after the shot, and restraining lines. She's got quite a list to go by. That's because of the position of the ball. Now the deep trail, her main purpose, his main purpose, is free space to goal or shooting space and all of those off-ball fouls. Notice we don't see any on-ball responsibility to the deep trail. Now, this might happen if the ball comes way out in front of her. She certainly can make a call. We all have to help each other with that. But know your responsibilities based on the position of, play, of the ball. And again, there's our warning sign, because if the lead gets out of position, nobody says that the C can't call an on-ball foul, even though it's over here. Maybe the person is headed towards C and they can see it better than the lead. So it all depends. That's the word of the day. In the next slide, we're going to see the ball on the other side. So we have a little change of responsibilities. And in this particular location, um, if you could click up. OK, we're going to start. See the star at the top, everybody? The C is on ball. She has free space to goal or shooting space. And then all of her other responsibilities are still there. They're just in a different order. OK, so your list changes. Some things come to the top. Some things drop to the bottom when the ball is in different positions around the, around the arc. And then the next responsibility is the lead. Notice where her on ball responsibility went from the top of the list to the bottom of the list. But she's always on ball. We know that. She knows where the ball is. She's on ball, but she can call any of those other fouls that she sees because she's off ball on the side. So she can catch picks. She can catch follow throughs. She can catch all kinds of fouls. So note on ball, off ball responsibilities. Now the deep trail is still off ball and has the same responsibility. So when you run down the field and you end up to be deep trail and you're five or six yards below the restraining line, make sure you know what this list looks like and make sure your eyes are off ball. I think everybody finds that the hardest part is not to follow the ball. So these three lists which fluctuate depending on uh, where the ball is, you have to pay attention to it. Now we don't have a slide for the ball in the middle, but I want you to consider the following. 
if the ball is in the middle of the arc, who gets what? What direction is the play going? Is it going towards C? Is it going towards the lead? So who can see the spaces between? Who's looking at the back of the player? If you're looking at the back of the player and, it, and, and the ball is coming down the middle, you should look for fouls on the back side of that player and continue to look off ball for sh shooting space or any picks. If the lead can see the front of the player, the lead can capture what's happening between the defender and the ball carrier. So you have to make some decisions there. Where are the other players? Am I blocked out? Now we've all seen a, the ball come down the middle and there's a big stack in front of the C official and she's watching all these picks and everything. Well, somebody's got to take the the ball carrier going down the middle. So there's you've got to be alert to the fact that your partner might get blocked out. So you've got to be ready to take over so that you can swap these, these responsibilities. Who has the best angle to see free space? Who has the best view of the space between the player coming down the middle? You may need to peek at your partner and see what they're focusing on and then take up the duties that aren't being covered or indicate to your partner that you will take the stack and have them take the ball. Even though it should be your responsibility, you've got all these players stacked in front of you. You can do a head nod, you can point your finger at the stack and say, I got this one, um, but try to <clears throat> make sure we never have six eyes on the ball. Okay. Okay, I'm good. Good, okay. Um, <clears throat> So we're gonna move into a little bit different um, look at those. That was kind of a basic look. So three person as opposed to two person, we're just simply gonna see more fouls because we have more eyes on the game. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about seeing the big picture versus the small picture and how three, the three person system allows us to cover both of those at the same time. And it's also gonna to lead to better game management. And I'll give you some um, helpful hints about managing the game. Um, especially when we get into the, the postseason where it gets a little more intense. So we're going to talk a little bit about improved, improved vision. Our focus will be on how we improve our vision and ability to communicate in the three-person system. Better vision is taking a look at what is best to focus on, where we need to get to be, have the best look at something, and how can we improve this. Our overall game management will improve with better communication with coaches, with players, with partners, and with the table personnel, and through our mechanics with the fans who are watching. <clears throat> Basically, our foul recognition really improves in these three areas. So we now have a third person to help with managing the draw which is, is very challenging with two people, especially when you're waiting for possession. Um, adding a trail along with the RC allows for better recognition of shooting space, and it improves the angle that we're used to seeing the cone within what we're looking for, somebody standing within the free space to goal. In transition, we can work together to cover off sides. Like the ball may travel up, I have some examples of this, the ball could travel up the A, B side. And so, like Maggie just said, the C may take a look at the restraining line violation. The other thing it improves is our ability to see during and after the shot so that the shooter and the defenders are safe. The ball goes to goal, it's okay to sometimes, when the ball is actually going to goal, to have the eyes all in that area because we gravitate towards the shooter um, looking from different angles for follow-throughs, propels, charges after the shot possibly, um, or if the shooter's being fouled after the shot. So here's an example of the draw. Now we have two people and they have two responsibilities. They have their initial responsibility will probably be the players on the circle. If 
C is responsible for the draw and any fouls that have to do with the two players taking the draw. A and B are going to watch to see that the two pairs on the circle don't jump in before the whistle. They're also going to watch to see that the other pairs don't come in before possession is gained. Now, one thing to think about is if the ball goes off the draw directly towards A or B, let's say A, the ball goes way over towards A and you've got the six, pair, the six players coming to play the ball towards A, then C is going to need to take responsibility of that restraining line, just as if it was going towards B. And B would have to then get on the ball if all the play and the ball is coming towards her. So it's really important to talk this over in your pregame. Foul recognitions. There's some fouls that having a third person make it much easier to call. Shooting space on the AB side is so much easier. The trail is now responsible for this. Trail has a great angle for this call. Occasionally, the lead would still make this call. For example, in a fast break situation, if the low defender on the lead side is in shooting space, the lead might just have better depth, per depth perception there to make that call. Fouls on the shots. Now we have three angles. All three officials should have a sense of when a player is going to goal. And therefore, we have a trail and a C, and sometimes the lead looking at the shooter. It's great to have, depending on what angle the shooter's coming in, that opposite angle person, if it's coming in on the A, B side, the C might have a really good look at what's going on during and after that shot. Offsides is another foul that we can manage better with three person. So in this picture, you can see that the A, B, you can see the table side, and A, B is going up that side, and there's a quick transition here, and C is in a perfect position to see that the white player has taken a step over the restraining line. Now, in this scenario, in high school, we're just going to hold our whistle and see if she comes right back, because that's the defender. But also, if it was an attacker, she'd be right there. So that's a good thing to talk about in your pregame as well. Okay, if any of you saw last week um, the official's view up on our Facebook page, it talked about looking at something versus seeing something. Before we move into this next area, I just want to briefly mention this. This is just an, an image to make my point. What do you see here? If you look at the zebras, can you see the lion? If you're looking at the lion, can you see the zebras? With our focus coming from three angles, we are increasing our awareness of the big picture and the small picture. I just wanted to think about this concept, looking at something versus actually seeing it. You can see something without looking at it. All right. And then we talked, Maggie did touch on who's on ball, who's off ball. So we have primary, someone's on the ball primary. We have somebody on um, their secondary is on the ball, and then we have people who are just off the ball. On most plays in a three-person system, it's typical for the play, the closer to the play or focus, the person is focused on the ball, while the others are watching off ball and see the ball in their secondary vision. The nearest official tends to have the smallest picture, such as on-ball fouls, what's happening right around the ball. And the two other tend to have a larger picture, maybe what's happening beyond the ball. As the ball moves and players change position, this will change. Your response, what your responsibility is depends on where the ball is and what the players are doing. So we're going to go take a look at some examples. I'll focus on lead for one, trail, and C, and what their vision should be focused on. Okay, so just to give you a uh, perspective, the lead and trail, you can't see the trail in this picture, um, are there in the C, and I put a big yellow ball for the uh, dot for the ball. This is really a challenge often in three person. When the ball is on the far side away from the lead, right now it's below the goal line extended. So lead has got to have an idea of 
what the next move might be. So she has to have an awareness of where the ball is. C is the one who really probably has a really good look at the ball. So if the player with the ball right now was contested and was in about that area, I would expect the C to be a little bit more on the ball. So lead is trying to make a decision to see should she go low if the ball gets further behind or come high. So the ball carrier <clears throat> is now headed towards goal. And you can see that C has a beautiful view of the between the players. Lead is starting to move higher because as the closer the ball gets to the goal circle or the more contested the ball is, the lead wants to be in a better position to see that as well. Now the ball is moving and the player is just cutting right through. So the lead, again, it's directly going to goal. C can help right here on the back side of the ball carrier. And lead can also look at the front. Lead must be able to see feet stepping in or on the goal circle, um, any contact on the back side of the white player, or any contact on the front side of the white player with the goalie. What I'd like to see here, if you notice the lead originally is a little bit flat, so we added, we uh, doubled her, and we moved her up. So this would be a better spot for that lead because there are two players, three players almost, right to her right, but she can probably see those players, even if she took a little bit, maybe a step further away. And this gives her a better angle to see the goal circle and to see those fouls right there. So just as that ball moved, um, the focus of lead started out kind of secondary, know where the ball is and have an idea of what direction it's going. But as it goes, then get into better position to see the fouls she needs to see. Okay, this gives that perfect angle, the tangent if you taught that way, but the perfect angle to see between the players. And especially when they're just tippy toeing around that goal circle, it's really crucial that you see whether she's on or in the goal circle. So as the ball moves closer to the goal, the lead has to move higher to see the players with the ball better. C's primary focus is on the ball carrier still and her opponent. Um, she has the best angle still to see some of what's between the players. C can still see, if she's looking at those two, she can still see the other players in front of her. And trail is completely off ball with most of this. So lead has to know where the ball is and can officiate this pair once they get closer to the goal. All right, now we're going to take a little bit of a look at trails focus. So here, to give you a perspective, again, I have the ball. C is a little bit out of the picture, and lead is also out of the picture. So right here, with the ball carrier going to goal, lead is going to change her primary to the front of these players. This player is being highly contested. Um, C can see the backside of those players. She can see also has a whole group of kids on her side of the field. So she has to pay attention to those, those players there. So the lead has space to get higher and maybe she should move there. So trail right here, her vision is, um, she can see the ball carrier, but she's not going to focus a small picture on that ball carrier and call on ball fouls, the lead will do that. Here she can see beyond the pair that's running past the front of the goal circle. She can also notice this lone defender sitting down here. And so that's a player that's beyond, beyond the ball carrier. As the ball moves in, so, <clears throat> excuse me, Trail is in a great position to see that that lone blue defender now has taken a step over. The attacker beat her opponent. And if this trail sees that as she's standing here like this, I want this trail to identify that that's potential shooting space on the right hand side. And so I would love to see her get her whistle closer to her mouth. So when this happens, she can immediately blow the whistle. The girl's already stepping into shooting space. So that's where we want to be prepared for that shooting space call. 
seeing below or beyond and anticipating this girl is going to step into that space. And that gives you an example. Perfect. Stepped right in. Number 18 can go to goal. And fortunately, she does not shoot. So when we have the shooting space call made, then what I like here, if we have the third official, this allows the lead to focus on the ball and can set this up. And the trail can see looking for shooting space. Trail should be looking, we said, beyond. So now that the call has been made, all three officials step in towards the critical scoring area. And this is what we like to see. So you can take a look at a picture right here and how this penalty zone is going to be cleared. So C is over there and she's taking a look at those people and what direction they need to go. Um, we'd like the trail who we hoped makes the call. Her, her, vo uh, her vocal should be shooting space on number five blue first inside hash. So she's going to give the directive. She's the one who should be making the call and she's the one who knows where it should be set up and who is going behind. And Lead's going to come in and help clear the penalty zone on her side. Okay, now we're going to take a look at C. All right, so here it's a um, a, our lead and trail are on the far side, and C is right in our vision. And you can see right here that the, I'm going to call them green, the green team has the ball, um, and they're spread out pretty far. So C is similar to our trail in the two person, only it's more involved, like Maggie said, called a second lead. Here we can see, take a look at C's need to cover the area, the field wide. But she also has to identify when she needs to focus on a smaller, more contested area. C is the only one on her side, so she has to cover the entire sideline, plus most of the players on her side. In this example, the ball has started with the first circle that's closer down towards the end line and now has moved up to the green player pretty much in front of, front of the C. And from here, it's going to, you can see the player to the left, the green player over kind of above the 12, she's asking for the ball. So <clears throat> there's no need for, we, also, we often want, people often want to be outside of the ball. You're, we're taught to stay outside of the ball. In this scenario, we can see that the low green player is wider than the C, however, the C can officiate that player or that space because it's not contested and it's not a contested space. So she can stay inside of the ball in this situation. So she doesn't have to run super wide just to watch a player catch and throw a ball. Now the ball has moved all the way across the field as it transitions to the AB side C now has to focus on what is happening in the critical scoring area where there are a number of players moving around. There's a lone blue player that's still very wide to C's right. And there's no need to actually, she's alone. She's not really going to foul. She, so there's not a whole lot. We know she's there. So we can see that she's there. We don't have to look at her. C can now look for the action between the players off ball, as well as there are a few players potentially in three seconds. If the team is moving the ball around here, C thinks that the low white might be in three seconds. If she thinks that low white player is in three seconds, <clears throat> what is her next move? If they're moving the ball like this, as they are, and she thinks that there's three seconds, there's no need for a flag. There is no scoring play here. So if she, if the ball was moving around and she thought that player was in three seconds, she's going to blow that immediately. And in the high school level, she's just going to take that player in three seconds and put her behind the ball. So three seconds is not always a flag, only when it's a scoring play. I like the position of this seat. She's got a good angle to see players to her, her left and her right, but also what's down in front of her. All right, so now we have, she's taking a look at all these different angles. And she's just going to scan from player to player to player. <clears throat> now 
now what we have is the ball. Oh, let me see. There we go. That's better. As the ball is passed from C's left to right between two very uncontested players. So the ball is going up and over her head, over from one side to the other. This is a great time for C to focus on the players in the critical scoring area. From this position, the C can see that both players, the passer and the receiver, are alone. And the only possible thing is they might miss the ball. So they're not going to foul. There's no need to watch the ball because the ball in the air is also not going to foul. So this is a great time to get a handle on what's going into the what's happening in the critical scoring area. And as you can see, C just changed her focus and it turned to see what is happening with the ball. She wants to see that the ball is being caught. And if you can look right at those players right at the top of the eight meter, she took her eyes off of that. And then we have some monkey business going on. So we can see that the player's catching the ball without without looking at it. So C so can keep her focus on those players. And she would see she's looking here, but we have a big foul right there. So there's no need to watch somebody catch the ball. Okay, and she's still focused. Now the girl, the green player to the right is passing the ball back and she remains focused here. So the C missed this entire foul that happened in there because she was watching a player catch the ball or pass the ball. Here she could see that without looking at it. All right. I want to move into communication. I know there's probably 100 questions, but I will get to those when, um, when we get towards the end. All right. <clears throat> With three-person crew, we can enhance our ability to manage all aspects of the game. Communicating with coach, the coach throughout the game is intensified as these games become games where you win or you go home. You have to have a plan and thoughts about handling this while you are calm. Practice, understand what, what you're going to do in a calm setting so that you can manage this when the setting gets intensified. We have the ability to increase our communications with the sidelines, including the coaches, the sub area, <clears throat> the timer, the scorer. This tends to bring up some calmness. If we are communicating and answering them, that tends to de-escalate some of the issues. <clears throat> Oftentimes we'll have also a table official. A table official is, is also used to help uh, with some of the sideline management. And time management starts with our timers and how we need to know from them what they know, what our crew knows. We have three sets of eyes. We can certainly take care of the clock awareness. So communication and management has to do with all these things. How do we interact with the sideline, with ourselves, with our partners, and with the scorer and timer and actually keeping track of the clock. So let's go into um, communicating with coaches. So we got to keep this simple. Coach asks us a question. We want to make sure we acknowledge that somehow. They Just acknowledging the question sometimes will de-escalate the situation. If there's a question that we can answer quickly, do so. If we then decide assess what's going on. We can answer a question and then what continues? Are we being badgered? Are they hearing our answers? Are we now getting trying to be intimidated? You have to assess what that is happening to you. And finally, have a plan of action. If you are warned, you have tools to make the action stop if you've warned the sideline already. Know what to do when coach carding a coach. There's a section on page 67 in the rule book you should know coach misconduct inside and out because when you card a coach, you, oh, sorry, there's uh, Larry. When you card a coach, your heart will be racing. So if you know the situation and you know the procedure, when you're calm, it'll come to you when you're a little nervous. All right, so acknowledging. How do we acknowledge them? We hear a coach, we can give them a head nod, we can peek over. I know the collegiate level, they say do a thumbs up. Um, you can also just say, I hear you, coach. Identify, then we need to identify what we need to respond to. We have coaches who will ask a question um, 
then we have coaches who will continue to ask the same question over and over. So we need to know what we're responding to. Are they questions or are they becoming comments? When we answer a coach, we always want to use the language of the rules. We definitely want to keep it brief. We don't want to go into some long dissertation. And we do not want to get in a debate. I think sometimes it's easy for officials who know that they know the rules a lot better than a lot of the officials or the official or the coach is, is describing a, a rule that isn't actually true. There's no need to get into a debate here. Arguing is not going to be productive in this situation. So we're going to assess what's going on and see what our action is. We have a coach. What was that call? Simple answer. If you know what it was, it held stick. Or if you don't know what it was, oh, I'll find out and get back to her. And do so. By the time you go back, half the time they don't remember even what they asked you. Then we might have a coach <clears throat> that's saying, that's an empty. That's a held stick. That's across the body. That's a this. That's a that. So we're going to assess that and what what can our action be? That's when we, we don't want to be distracted. We don't want what the coach is trying to do to distract us, intimidate us, or make us try to make calls for them. So at that point, I would say that is enough coach. Um, I've also said something to them like, coach, you're here to coach your players and not the officials. If it continues to escalate, something comes out that's real personal. That's when uh, we draw the line in the sand and we don't tolerate that and we have a tool for that. So if they get personal towards you, that's when you need to take Take your card out. Hopefully before this has happened, you've already warned them. That is enough, coach, is, is a warning. Time management. <clears throat> know your timer. You need to know the timer and you need to know the clocks. What, it's really nice to go over and, and find out what the kids or the people at the, at the uh, table's names are because people react to their name better than, hey, timer, something's going wrong. You need the clock stopped. You need something done. If you yell somebody's name, they're going to react a lot quicker. You want to find out if they've done this job before. And you also want to find out what they can tell you about the actual clock and the horn. You definitely want to know, is the horn an air horn? Is it an automatic horn? So you need to find out some information from them. And then you need to set them up for success. So there is a, a timer sheet. Um, could have uploaded that uh, in our <laughs> our uh, uh, officials training stuff. Um, we spend spend some time with them explaining their duties as well as ask them what they already know. It's good to start there. Like, what do you know about this? Tell me what you know about you know when you're supposed to start and stop the clock. Um, remember that they can also have a horn there if a coach wants to come over for a possession timeout and remind them that a possession timeout means the ball's actually in one of their player's sticks before they beat the horn. And then if we give a card or we have timeouts, we want to make sure that one of the crew goes over to the table when a card is given. Make sure that the table is writing down the player, the time of the card. The release time is really important because that's the one the coaches are going to run over and ask for. If a team takes a timeout, just quick check in with them and review, find out how many timeouts each team has um, and make sure that they have the same thing as you, somebody's on your crew is writing. And if there's overtime, make sure you review with that timer um, all the overtime procedures. Team management, time management with our team. All right, we gotta keep an eye on the clock to help us catch issues quickly. So do you know when would be a good time to peek up at the clock? If it's during play um, and it's right in front of you, you're not going to peek up at the clock. But if we have settled play or we're way off the ball or there's a foul in the CSA, times that we really want to check up and peek the clock is if we're just under two minutes and the clock needs to be stopped. If we're in overtime after a goal or when a car, uh, timeout is called, we want somebody to write down the cards and timeouts, and if you have them, stick checks. 
Um, so you need to determine that all three of you aren't going to write down. Your heads are not all going to go out when a card is given, go down when a card is given, or time out, or an alternate possession. Just have one of the crew members should have eyes on the field. So if two people want to write that, that's fine. And then remind each other of some odd situations and how you're going to handle those. What do we do if we have an inadvertent whistle, or inadvertent horn, or a player comes onto the field early? So we need to review that kind of stuff as a team. Um, if a penalty is released during a draw, um, that is also an odd situation. So you want to make sure you manage that. If, if we have a goal and we may only have five seconds left in the penalty and we're pretty sure we might not get possession, somebody go over and talk to the table and get them to help you not have that player come in if they've already got three in between the restraining lines during that draw until possession is gained. Now they can choose to have two in there and leave the others behind. And when that card is released, she can jump in at that point. Also double check if you have a card right towards the end of halftime or right before, if you have an overtime, that that card is going to carry over. Make sure they know who's sitting out in the chair when you start the second half, how much time is left on the card, and what is the release time on the card. So okay. We'll Maggie, go into pregame a little bit. Yep. Yeah, and um, the three things we're going to cover are um, how does the two-person pregame compare to the three-person pregame? Uh, we're going to discuss the shaded areas. We're going to discuss communicating with each other and coach communication, which some of which um, Liz has already covered. Um, so when we go into the first section uh, discussing the shared areas of cover, coverage um we're going to start with the draw could you click that liz for me yep yep i was starting to answer questions that's okay <laughs> double yeah. duty yeah. okay okay on the draw you're going to count the number of players before the draw make sure now it's only necessary to have 12 players on the field at the draw so um after that if they want to play with Less than 12, that's, a, that's up to them. But on the draw, you should have 12 if they have 12 players. So um, make sure that you're aware of the number of players that are available. Um, you have to concentrate and share the players on the circle and the restraining line. Like Liz said, and, and a lot of people don't have this discussion. If the ball goes towards B, then the person who did the draw will cover B's restraining line. If the ball goes towards A, then the, the C will cover A's restraining line. That's an important thing to get worked out because you don't want six eyes on possession. It's not necessary. So work that out in the, um, in the pregame. In the CSA, we're going to go for um, how you're going to assist on the free positions, um, what we're doing with false starts. If we have a false start behind the free position, if we have a false start on the side of the free position, um, we're going to cover who's going to cover the end lines, who's going to help with the coffin corner, which is a usual assignment. Um, between the C and the trail, this is a piece that um, gets a little not enough uh, coverage. So the C and the trail have to work together. They have to help with the restraining line. If the ball's coming up C's side, the trail's got to stick around. They can't take off. They can't hand it off. If it's going up the trail side and the trail wants to leave or they're on ball, then the C's going to have to stick around and help the trail with the restraining line. Now, when you give off or take, accept the restraining line, please have the proper count. Uh, don't just take it for the sake of taking it. The other thing the C and the trail need to coordinate is covering the middle of the arc. So if C gets dragged way out towards the sideline, chasing a boundary ball. The trail should move over towards the center and vice versa. If the trail gets pulled out to do a boundary or a foul near the boundary, or then the C is going to have to slide over to the middle. But make sure the middle of the arc is being covered. The off-ball responsibilities, 
who's looking on ball, who's looking off ball in transition. So if the ball's going up the AB side, maybe C is off ball. A and B are, are a bit on ball because they might have to trade off the restart. Um, but make sure that you have a clear cut idea. Now, it all depends on the location of the ball. So it, is, it isn't stamped in stone. Um, off ball responsibilities on free position setups. Make sure, make sure you um, have a discussion about that. And CSA play off ball responsibilities. The next section is on shared areas of coverage and um, communicating with your partners. Um, how do we? How are we going to manage the midfield if we have a double whistle? How are we going to manage that? Restarts in the shaded areas, the shared areas. That's where we can hand it off to our partner if it's in. If you ha need to get ahead, make sure you give them the information though. Eye contact, especially in the CSA, make sure that you're having really good eye contact on who's going to take the ball, who's who's going to take the picks, who's going to, if you ha it, get in a situation, who's going to do the restart. Um, boundary calls. Um, because there's a self-start, the boundary calls are going to be a little quicker, but remember they have to come to a pause position and then go. It's not like the college game where they can run in. Um, the deep trail covers the side boundary in the attacking end of the field. So the trail is there so that the lead can stay on, stay closer into the arc and get ready for a transitioning ball that might come back from the sideline and come back into the arc quickly. So the deep trail is going to chase that ball out to the sideline and make that decision. So the lead does not have to move. The restraining line, as we discussed, make sure that you have the count before you pick it up and don't just give an indication that you've got it and you have no idea how many people are back there. Off ball in transition, setting up fouls in the CSA. Um, seems like we've got a very, very long list here. It should be long. And some of it are just, yes, okay, that's how we're going to do it. And it doesn't have to be a, a huge discussion. Just make up your mind that you're going to work as a team. The last part of the three-person pregame is communication with the coaches. If your signals are good, you'll have good communication. Stick check request. Who's going to perform it? Questions during the game. Working as a team to respond. Okay, you might have... The coach might bring you together at halftime and have a question. Figure out who's going to answer it. If you've got a head official or or you've worked out what has happened in that situation, then have one person be the speaker. If you have an unruly coach, make sure you tell your partners that you've had to have multiple conversations on your sideline because when that when your partners rotate, they may, they may give the may not know that you have already given a verbal warning of some sort to this coach. So, you know, let them know. And the game clock awareness, uh, game and clock awareness. Discuss rough play, discuss whether you're going to upgrade cards and, and how you're going to do that. Um, remind them that there's injury timeout, there's no coaching, and Especially in this playoff season, the overtime procedures may be different in, in your state than what they've been covering in the regular season or your association. Make sure you have a copy of the overtime procedures in your bag or on the table so that all the coaches are aware of what the overtime procedures are. And, and when you get to that coaches meeting or captains meeting and you ask for confirmation on their equipment, you might want to go over the overtime procedures for postseason. Uh, During the game, we have to have really good teamwork. Check in with your partners throughout the game. Be sure to check in with them. 
This could be just simply eye contact, arm signals, or a quick comment after a goal. Make them quick so the players are not waiting for you at the draw. You may have incidences where the clock will be stopped for something unusual. If you have to converse at that time, make it quick and make sure that, that if you are changing the call or giving the ball to the opposing team, that someone goes to the sideline and informs the coach and the table why this happened. You can inform the table in case a coach has a question after you go to restart the game and possibly the table can help them. If you're gonna have a table official, that's even better, but make sure you tell the table official um, why your decision happened and what the decision was. Be supportive of your partners. We are a team out there and we all need to trust each other and help each other throughout the game. Be the type of partner you want to work with. Now our last section is on post game. And the one thing I can say to you is in capital letters, have one. Make sure you have a post game. Consider the fact that you may have another playoff game, a sectional game, a regional game, or a state playoff game. You need to learn from your experience in this game and every three person event that you do take the time to have a post game and have a good post game. Your, your discussion should include um, all of these pieces here, the unusual situations or incidences that happen, how we could have done it better, uh, what you yourself could have done better, make yourself a little list. Like I, I should have made that call or I could have made that call. I was in the wrong position. How can I do that better? And if you move on to another playoff game, you will appreciate the feedback and the introspection that you covered in this post-game discussion. The learning, whether it be in three man or two man should never stop. And you should continue to have a really good post game at every any and every game you always do. If not with your partners, have it with yourself. Mm -hmm. And I thank you for your time. Liz has questions to answer, I believe. Yeah, um, I have a few questions. I know we've just gone uh, three minutes over nine o'clock, so I want to make this quick. Um, the, somebody asked about clarifying um, splitting if you have a, a lead and a C and how do we split that space in half there's not a definite line there so when we say C is a second lead there's going to be spaces where if you're looking at the back side of somebody you may have a call on the back side so um, generally speaking if you saw when I showed you the um, the piece of the lead they were both kind of off ball and they could see the ball and then even though it was on the C side, the lead had to get onto the ball as it went towards goal. So there isn't a definite, um, you know, let's split it right down the middle. Uh, we, you can't really do that because play changes all the time. So it depends on where the ball, the ball is. We have a lot of answers to the boundary, the one reboundary start. Um, that's not a oh, self-start. Goalie is closest, and it's a whistle start. Right. And she's in the goal circle. Yes. Um, off the draw, if the ball goes out, I believe an AP would whistle start. So if the ball goes out of bounds, if I'm reading this correctly, if the ball goes directly out of bounds off of a draw, it's a redraw. Oh, goalie restart. <clears throat> um, and again, this is another question about um, the depth of, of sea and trail. See, you definitely want to have some sense of a triangle. Um, you, we really don't want the deep trail in closer than the C. It's not awful that if they're, you know, at kind of on the same um, level, horizontal level on the field. Um, typically, the, the trail will be a little bit deeper. But the trail in settled play is also coming in a little closer. We don't want trail to stand out on the restraining line. We don't want C to stand out on the restraining line. So we want people to come on in and get involved in settled play, especially when there's a call made and then um, somebody needs to help 
clear that penalty zone. And I kind of feel like that's that's pretty much the questions. I did answer a few along the way. So um, like I said, um, I don't want to keep you too long. This will be posted. I'm going to pull off the video and it'll be posted on the US Lacrosse website probably in a couple days. Um, it's usually under girls rules. If you go to officials on the main page and then girls rules and you scroll down to the bottom, the previous ones are posted there on the, as a video. I will try to also put this up um, under officials resources as a PowerPoint. So again, thank you all for your time um, and good luck in your postseason. Enjoy your your postseason and um, have some great games out there. All right. Good night.